More to Marketing. Welcome to More to Marketing, a podcast on marketing, product, and everything in between. I'm your host, Susan, and we're going to be talking about product management. We are in for a real treat. We have Irene Liakos here, and she's come to share some of her huge experience in product management. Over the years, Irene has actually managed and launched the first phone with an app store, the Hip Top. Worked with me, myself, at Virgin Mobile, where we launched the virally successful adaption of data gifting. And she has actually got her own skincare brand and it was invited to the Emmys. Now, that is a huge win. You can actually see that all over her pro pages as well. With experience across telco, tech, fintech, banking, beauty products, product consulting and teaching, we're in for a real treat with Irene today. So, Irene, welcome. Thank you for having me. I am so excited to have you here. Tell, tell us a bit about yourself in your own words and a little bit about your experience. So I'm one of these people that is intensely curious um, and has always been, you know, that kid that was always like, why? Why is it like this? You know, really annoying to mum. Um, <laughs> I love it. Which is the perfect grounding to be uh, find myself in product management, which I got into by accident over 20 years ago, had no idea what it was, decided I absolutely loved it um, mm-hmm. and have been doing product management in corporates um, before I did my own skincare brand and also consulting and even teaching product management because that's the only way we're going to really solve these big problems the world has and there are so mm-hmm. many um, and to solve them, we need to do it at scale. So get a lot of product thinking out there. And so exactly right. And also focusing on the customer needs, not just their wants, so that you are solving that problem. Yeah, I go deeper with it. And I have done since 2018 when I was teaching at General Assembly, where it's not about needs, it's about pain. True. Pain, pain is- need around those what is the most painful thing that a user has and that isn't being solved anywhere else that they are willing to pay for? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Fantastic. Well, let's get let's get into some of these questions we've got to go through today. I'm really excited to hear some of your responses. So what I suppose one of the biggest questions out there, and I don't think many people have the right answer, but what is the role of a product manager? We hear that phrase a lot. I think a lot of businesses don't use it in the right way, but what is an actual product manager? So when a product manager has done a great job, you never know about it. You don't know it's happened. It is so behind the scenes. I mean, even Kagan talks about the product manager that worked on Google search and maps. And, you know, they're not famous. No one knows them. And that's because they don't want to be. They're the ones that are actually solving the problem. They care so much about the problem. Ego is left at the door. It is very much about um, understanding and finding the most painful problem to solve and working collaboratively within a team to solve it. So there's sort of like an art and a science to product management. The art side is about really imagining the future, knowing the business goal, What is it, the value that the business needs? Using curiosity and empathy to go deep and uncover the the most painful user problem that no one else has solved, that is untapped, um, and understand the market and competitors and looking for clear space to solve it. So, you know, looking for something that, that you have a differentiator in. And then it's about defining the path to get there. How do you get their product strategy, the roadmap, never forgetting go to market because you could have the best product, but if you haven't thought about how your customers will find you, how you'll reach them, then it doesn't matter. Um, Gibson Biddle, CPO of Netflix, talks about three things when he talks about product strategy. He talks about it needs to be desirable. And, I mean, we Mm -hmm. always knew that we need to make sure that we're solving a painful problem that someone cares about and is willing to pay for. It needs to be, um, I think he talks about uh, he does, hard to, hard to co- how to copy, which, you know, anyone who's done an MBA knows, which I have, knows that you need to be able to differentiate. What's your mm. differentiator? It's Never that blue ocean part, isn't it? it? Sorry? That blue ocean part. Yeah, it's not thinking that 
as a business or looking at your product that you copy a competitor. In fact, never, ever copy a competitor. Go deep and solve that problem for the customer in a way that is better than a competitor does. So, you know, it needs to be a differentiated. It needs to be hard to copy. Um, you need to solve a valuable problem. But because you're a business, you know, Gibson talks about it as margin enhancing, which we all know, anyone who's ever looked at a P&L, make sure it's profitable. And that's probably a, um, a future podcast. I don't think a lot of business managers actually understand P&Ls and how they reflect back to product economics. Yeah, I've noticed that going from like corporate product management where I looked at the P&L and looked at the costs, the things that make up the costs of a product, the, the revenue, your price, things that make up the revenue and that, you know, the, the profitable what the profit is. And that's really crucial because I've noticed that when I've been consulting with scale-ups and, and startups, a lot of the product people in those um, companies never see the P&L. And that was just mind-blowing for me because then it's like, well, well, how do you know you're creating value? Yeah, it's you know? about, about the pricing strategy and making sure it makes sense for the business's needs and goals. And also even going down to the level of campaigns and return on investments out of that product. I, I know there's a lot of people that still struggle with that, even trying to get access to the data to do it. And no one should hold back data within an organisation. They're all there for that same goal. Yeah, so the crucial thing is the transparency of that data, being able to speak the language of the C-suite, of the leaders, of the, the people that are deciding where the funding goes is crucial. Um, and also, you know, as a product manager, the other thing, I mean, p is super important, but being able to inspire and recruit others to deliver that future that you've seen, that you want to build, that you've got in that strategy and roadmap, and that is like partners, stakeholders, internal, external, you know, I, you know, I've heard about, you know, managing stakeholders, and in my mind, everyone's a partner on this journey. And you need to bring them all on board on that story, on that vision. They need to buy in, believe into that vision. Um, you know, you need to work with the squad or the develop delivery teams on delivering that vision and collaborate with them to make sure you're solving it the best way possible, not designing that solution yourself in isolation and then asking them to build it, which is a recipe for disaster. So that whole evangelism piece is important in the sense that you're bringing people on that journey. And, and even going back to one of your other points, the whole go-to-market strategy, that's not just about how you actually go out into the world with your product. It's also about all those internal stakeholders and bringing them on the journey so they feel like they're part of it and that they're really going to be spruiking this in the best way possible for all customers, internal or external. Yeah, it's about thinking and meeting your customers where they are never expecting them to come to you, never expecting the build it and they will come ID because that's a myth. You know, it's, it's really, gone. yep. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> definitely, definitely. Um, but I still see it. I still see uh, this whole idea of build it and they will come because people are really passionate about whatever mm -hmm. they will build. Um, but yeah, product management, it is about de-risking those three things, that desirability. So you know that whatever you're building solves a real customer problem um, and it's very that customer market fit. There is the feasibility, which is that delivery of the operational side of the capability, technology, engineering, the tools to execute. And then there's viability, which I think there's a lot of room for improvement, understanding profitability, making sure it's a sustainable business model, it's commercially viable, um, it's profitable, it stands on itself. If you can make it so that your customers love your product, that they bring others. Word of mouth, very powerful. Word of mouth, tapping into the network effect. Um, you know, they talk about network effect, viral, whatever it is, it's a lower customer acquisition cost. And everyone wants their customers to love their product. Nobody wants hostages. And that's where I think, going back to your example of Netflix, it'll be really interesting to see what the impact is of them changing the rules that they've done for signing in because you could be in two different locations and sign into the one account Yeah, uh, with, with, that, with the model they used to have. I'd be interested to see when they release their next round of results what the impact was. 
because that's definitely a change in behaviour from what the product originally was possibly designed to do to be able to get the word of mouth out there. Yeah, it's really interesting. When you change the product, it's about managing the customer experience. Um, And even when you talk about exiting products, Google exited a whole lot. Netflix is looking at exiting. You know, it's not like exit and you're done. It's it's a reverse go to market and it's a reverse product launch. And it's like, what? how do you manage that experience for your end users so that it is still positive? So perhaps you retain them on a different product or you handhold them to a new product that may be not yours, could be a partner um, or a, um, another competitor, but just making sure that that customer experience is not going to damage your business, your brand, your um, your product. And that's where um, I know you're very passionate about outcome focused. Do you want to talk a bit more about that? So outcome is really important because there's not, you know, there's multiple ways to get to your end goal. And the question is, you know, what is the most efficient, effective way to get there, um, to acquire new customers, to retain customers, whatever that company goal is, or OKR or KPI, whatever you know, your organization is using, the question is what is the best way to get there that's going to have, you know, reduce the risks of for desirability, viability, feasibility, but also, you know, you tap into, um, you know, that good brand and I guess retention aspect or referral aspect. How do you get customers to, even though you're, you're, sol- you're solving this problem, maybe that they don't, you know, you're exiting a product, How do you do it in a way where you still have a good outcome from the customer perspective? Um, And and also that your brand as well, that you've put so much money into investing into to make it big, beautiful, customer focused. You don't want to have anything detrimental against that for people not to want to try your game in the future. Absolutely. That is so important. I used to think um, that it was always about, it was all about the product, that everything else, it didn't matter. And, you know, we talk about lipstick on a pig. That's what, you know. And I, and I really believe that you could have the best product, but if your brand lacks trust, lacks, um, you know, awareness, people don't know who you are, then it doesn't matter that you have this great product and you solve this painful problem. Um, If you can't get customers on board, there isn't that trigger or that pull to bring them over. And often the brand is that trigger. I trust this brand. And that's why you see a lot of customers who are, you know, we talk about them as laggards. They don't move off, you know, a poor product experience or poor business because they've been there for so long. They, they, is that better the devil they know? You know, they, you know, in, you know, that's, that's where I use the term hostages because, you know, they won't look around. They won't uh, even think about changing because of the risk of change. You know, people don't like change. So you need to have a, you don't just need to be slightly better than the, the current experience. You need to be, you know, they used to say 10x better. You, you need to be substantially better than the current experience, whether it's cheaper, faster, or, you know, the user experience. It needs to be hugely better to get those customers to trigger across. Mm. No, I, I think that that's definitely worth further conversations in the future because there is so much in that alone. Uh, how do you iterate, improve, and then have the best outcome for customer customers when you want to focus on them, but also, also your own growth too. But um, but what is, so we've talked about product managers. What's product management? So product management, I love this because product management is part of marketing. That's where it started. It's been around since, you know, the brand men of Procter & Gamble and, <clears throat> you know, FMCG products. It's been around before tech. And so it's really interesting to me that a lot of, um, you know, tech companies, you know, think of product managers as an extension of engineering. And I always have to explain that, no, it's not. It's been around for longer and it's it's a completely, it's part of a different area. And I think it's it's come to a period of time where it's coming to its own, you know, you see CPOs, um, you know, outside of CMO uh, or the marketing area. But I think, um, so product management is definitely about making sure you are solving a painful problem in the market that um, no one else can solve as, as good as you. 
and then working with the, the rest of the company, whether it's a tech product, engineering, development, design, to deliver that product and, and deliver it, get get to the outcome you want to get to. So it's very, yeah, it's it's definitely quite quite a polarizing conversation because I see, you know, product is part of marketing, but it's also been seen as part of engineering. And, and I think that's the one of the problems I see of people still thinking it's engineering is not necessarily the engineering team will be close to customers to understand how to solve and what they're actually doing. So that's where it becomes really important to have a part of the marketing arm, which includes research, customer service, and all those other touch points that will really bring it down to grassroots to know that you are doing the right problem-solving activities. And I think also under Agile, uh, which has been around for over 20 years, the idea of um, empowered engineering teams, empowered delivery, is really important because that's the only way you're going to innovate. Uh, so, you know, making sure that the engineering team, and some of them don't, you know, they'd like to just be coding. They don't want to mm. talk to customers. They don't, but the importance of sharing what the problem is and how it impacts users and having engineers hear a recording or statement from the end user's own words is really powerful. So they're not just building a blue widget. They're solving a real problem. Yeah. I completely agree. And I, I suppose this leads us into our next avenue of we've, we've talked mostly about existing businesses, but do you believe there's a role in product management where it differs depending on your business stages? So that startup versus mature. So I've noticed that, yes, product management I've seen in startup is very much a, you know, it's almost like a delivery focused, um, you know, building in, uh, delivery project management style of product management which is a little bit dangerous right because then they can be stuck in a, a build trap where they're just building features um features experience you know and not actually solving problems and that's and so, where mvps are important isn't it well it's really important to start with what your product vision is what's mm -hmm. your end goal not the company vision although it must align with it but what is the product vision for that specific product that you're building and, and what's the strategy, product strategy that will help you get there? Now, these need to align with the company vision, but often companies have multiple products. Um, so a product vision really needs that starting point. So every time you look at building something, a feature, um, something in the product roadmap, you're creating a user story, the question is, does it align with the vision? Would it help us get to the, the end goal, the outcome? Um, and kind of validate that rather than just build what the loudest person in the room asks you to do, which in a startup is often, you know, the leadership team. Exactly. And it's usually quite small. How do you say no? No, but so it's really important to go, okay, great. That's a great idea. Now let's go validate it. Let's go test it. Let's go MVP it. Let's go um, do some customer research. Let's create some Wizard of Oz. Let's like just test it. Let's test it before we you know, lock it into multiple sprints and use all our resources to build something that perhaps nobody wants mm. and that nobody will pay for. So particularly on that stream, knowing that startups um, are trying to, to do things for the first time, what advice would you give them? Validate. Definitely validate before you build anything because you can often get caught up and super excited about, what you have, you know, as a founder or as a as leadership team, but what's in your head about what you want to solve. Um, and you run in that direction and you're passionate about it. And the passion is fabulous, but you should validate it. So you're not wasting people's time, effort, that you actually, you want to get to that goal of solving that problem, that painful problem. Um, so the and research, test and learn. Head. Yep. Yeah. So I, I've done multiple, you know, customer empathy validation interviews, uh, surveys um, to understand what customers want. And this is really, you know, there's the what customers are doing, what users are doing in the platform, in the application, and I'll use multiple tools to see what's happening in the customer journey, what they're doing, where they're dropping off, where they're lingering, where they look uncertain. So you can, you can optimise what they're doing, but that's never going to tell you why they're doing that, why they chose you. 
what they were doing before you existed, um, what they like about your product, what they don't like about your product. Uh, if you didn't exist, what would they do? What the alternative? Like, and I think that question is super crucial because then you understand who the customer is comparing you to. And so that could be, that may not be your competitor. That may be a, you know, a substitute product or maybe the customer is doing it themselves at a higher cost, longer time, more effort. And, a, you know, that's the kind of thing you want to unpack. What are they doing today? What's really painful about it? What they like, what they don't like, what they wish existed. I mean, you never ask a customer what they want to build because, you know, you'll get faster horses like the whole Henry Ford quote. And they'll have but, no idea. <laughs> exactly. And so they don't know, but they don't know what they don't know. And it's not their job to know that, you know, AI can do this faster or there is this new tech that's, you know, coming into effect that will solve this problem. So you really need to go deep on the problem, understand what the customer values, who they compare you against, and then actually even map out and prioritise what the experiences the user needs, high to low, and map that against what exists today from a competitor perspective and how the user perceives. And so that's really important, the perception of value, how they perceive the com that experience, that feature against the competitors. Because you want to be in that space where, and I talk about this when I was training um, pricing strategy, I talked about this matrix of competitive advantage. And I've got, like it's a quadrant, it's four squares, where it's like you have the customer's perception of value from high to low and um, the, the market, the competitors, your product, where do you sit uh, from high to low? And from there, I look at, uh, because obviously you want to be creating experiences, features, products that your customers value, and you want to do it better than they com the competitor does. And so instead of building everything your competitor do has, um, or the alternative or the substitute has, you want to build where it matters, where they value it, where they're willing to pay for it um, in that space. And that's, that takes time. But once you set that groundwork, that sets up your, you know, your product for success. Yeah, I definitely, I definitely agree with that. And I think there's a lot of companies, big companies at the moment that are going off building these things that they think is fandangle, doing it for free, thinking there'll be a perceived value from, for the customer and they're not getting any cut through. So did they actually did research? Did people say they wanted it but didn't understand it? It'd be interesting to understand some of those big companies and the decisions for these because um, myself coming from very recently from a, a large company, I saw some of the things they were developing and I was even questioning myself, why were they actually solving a big problem or not? And that's more of that mature. But if we, if we go back a step to the scale up, what, what are your thoughts on the product, the role of product management in a scale up? So in a scale up, you're, there's a lot more, there's a little bit more funding. So you, you know, I mean, the utopia is in a, in a large company where there is a lot of resources and you can do, you can see, you have reports, you have peers in uh, other markets. Like when I was at Telstra, you know, I could talk or even in the other telcos as well, I could talk to peers in other companies on the other side of the world and understand and and, under, and and talk through what they launched, what they did, what problem they were solving, how they solved it, what did they learn? And then go, would that happen in this market, in our local market? And and then validate that in a in a low risk way. A scale up is, is sort of in the middle where you can do that as well. I think um, there's that growing pains where they grow quite quickly. And, you know, there's still that element of uh, can I, I get access to that PL or do I need to still prioritize using rice and Moscow and value from that end, which is a bit more abstract? Um, so I think in a scale up, there's a lot more resources to to build and test. You can have a few more bets, whereas in a startup, you have less bets and less less funding to do those bets. In a in a scale up, you can actually test a bit more, and uh, there's that multiple, there's that growing pains that happens as well, but. Mm -hmm. um, I think there's a lot of learning that you can get from that cross-pollination from a corporate to scale up and down to a startup in terms of learning. 
Uh, so, in- so jumping into that mature, more corporate, going back to the role of marketing management, how, how does that one differ again? Because now you're going to have a big organisation, lots of resources, probably lots of opinions and a bit of a cash flow going on here. So, so corporate's really interesting because the I've noticed that, you know, you definitely need to make sure everyone's on that journey. You do need to manage the partners internal to the organisation, external to the organisation, get them on board, empathise with not just your end users, but your partners, your stakeholders, the commercial team who's going to, help you with that business case and the and make sure that uh, it financially stacks up. Empathise with the legal team and regulatory and compliance to make sure that you've got their, their requirements into the product, but also ask them and validate how important they are. What is the risk of not, not solving that problem? Um, has there been any precedent has there been any, and, and really validate. So I think there's that strength that needs to happen in, for a product person to be successful is to not push back, but just ask questions. Mm. And I think Stay that's... curious, find out why something is important. Yeah, and I think what, one of the things that you said that really resonates to me is what happens if you don't do anything? Sometimes I, I find that business cases, when you're presenting it into leadership, that's the missing piece is that if, if you just sit back and idle and it can be a deal breaker sometimes for businesses for growth, particularly in a fast changing environment. Over COVID, we have had 10 year plus jump ahead in IT. So therefore, there's some companies that are going to be scrambling to catch up for consumer needs. So I do find that that quite a problem to solve for quite a lot of businesses. That's exactly right. When I launched the Telstra Hip Top, the precursor to Android, and that was at a time when everyone had Nokia's and Telstra was number one, um, had a you know a large market share, um, but everyone had Nokia's. They were they were, the the market was declining, so you know they had an aging market or aging customer base and. Um, and so they were they were struggling to bring new users under the age of 25 who weren't, you know, for the first time, were, were for the first time paying for their mobile phone. Mum and dad was no longer paying. Where did those customers go? And so with the hip top, I was tasked with solving this problem of how does an incumbent that's been around for hundreds of years um, attract that, you know, that younger age demographic to purchase products from them, purchase a mobile phone. And so I went and scoured looking around the world for a solution. How did other markets solve this problem? Not just in telco, but in adjacent industries. That's that blue ocean. That's like, you know, innovation happens at the edges. And so I was looking in Israel. I was looking in India. I was looking in um, the US, in, in Germany. And I'd found that in Parts of the, uh, the other parts of the world, there were devices where you could message, right? You could connect with your peers, you know. Um, they were chatting constantly, I think. So this was, my, you know, mid-2000s. Uh, they were interested in, in sharing photos and engaging. And, you know, this is like pre-Instagram. And so I found um, this device called the Hip Top. It was the software provider was called Danger. The founder, Andy Rubin, then went on and created um, Android, but the hip top was this real grounding in the first device that had everything backed up to the cloud, had an app store. So you could play games or you could have a calendar in there. You could have your email in there. You know, I negotiated my space to be preloaded, which I know is pretty funny, but like that is the, the precedent for social connectivity and social media, right? Um, it had a web browser before that. We we're all struggling with WAP, which was the most horrible experience (laughs) and this device you know um i had to negotiate to get this launched in telstra uh, and manage and inspire stakeholders about this product that was very different to their normal mobile services and so it was very much about uh enabling a test doing it in a way that would not risk the cash cow I mean, that's really important. I mean, every company worries about their cash cow. 
And there's always that, do we make hamburgers ourselves? Do we um, outsource to a point? Yeah, so they do know they need to change, Mm -hmm. uh, but change is hard for anyone. It's a human nature. So it's very much about how do we, how do I understand what my partners internally and externally are worried about and how do I mitigate those risks as much as I can? So, you know, we talk about de-risking, it's doing the same thing. The other thing is with the hitch was the first time that a device that was going, uh, a mobile device was back, being backed up to a cloud or a server outside of Australia. And so I had to get, I had to negotiate with the government as well for, you know, how, how to understand what the boundaries were. How do we manage privacy, risk, all of these things? And so, you know, this was the first, I guess this was kind of like a learning of fire for me because it was one of my early product roles. But it was very much understanding all those risks, all these partners and stakeholders that were crucial to this product had that I needed to mitigate so I can launch this product. And when I did finally launch it, this was the first phone that people queued up for. I had never, ever seen someone queue up for a phone before. Remember, this was before iPhone. Mm. And so I was, yep. from that moment, Susan, I was hooked. I'm like, how do I create <laughs> products that people love and that they queue up for? And it, it's not just a phone. This is you connect. It's connection. It's connection, connecting with my peers. And it's not just people. What I learned was it wasn't just users under 25. It was also uh, the blind community mm. or hearing. I think it was hearing impaired because they could then, you know, message. It, was, it had QWERTY keypad. Um, it was just much easier to use. So it really, I think it changed people's lives. I mean, it changed the trajectory of what a mobile phone looked like. You know, before that, everyone was looking for smaller phone. I mean, even Zoolander, when that came out, they were talking about, the, you know, the, the model um, was talking about, can we get a small phone? And there's this one scene where his phone, it's a flip and it's so tiny and it was the height of cool. <laughs> but um, so it was under that environment. And and that goes perfectly to the next question, which is all about, this is all about product design. So making sure that products are designed with that growth mindset, which is exactly what your example was about bringing a device to market with that growth mindset of how much more it could do within the future. How can we generally just go about this? And are there any special skills we need to consider for success? Um, so product mindset on this, I think, is really important to leave your biases at the door. I think that's really crucial. It's really hard to do for product. And, and egos, if I may add. Egos, yes. Leave the ego, leave the bias, leave all of that. Um, I mean, take your knowledge and learnings and pattern recognition, because I think pattern recognition is a big one. Because often as a product person, you see the future before anyone else sees it, because you've seen these patterns. You've kind of seen these dots. and. And so then it's like, how do I get everyone else to see this too? And how do I help them through this change, um, de-risk what they're worried about? What is it that they mitigate those risks, those fears that they have, get the honest, have those empathetic conversations to get the the honest, um, you know, truth of what they're worried about. Because if you don't get that, if you don't have those relationships with your partners to understand what they're worried about, you can't help solve it. Yeah, and, and it goes stuff. it goes to that making them feel inclusive in the creation and decision making as well. So they don't feel like they're being told, but they're part of the discovery. Part of the discovery, definitely. And I think the more you do this as a product person, the more you start to know what your partners are worried about before they tell you what they're worried about. And so you mitigate those issues before they tell you about them. And so then you have stronger relationships with those partners. You know, and that's so crucial, especially in corporates, to get things done. Where, um, you know, if I if I didn't do that, then the hip top would you know would never have existed. It would never have gone live, and it was the highest average revenue per user product, mm. even today for a mobile product. Customers were paying a hundred dollars a month. I had three hundred three hundred fifty thousand customers at the end of three years. completely new to the company. So it solved that problem of how do we bring new users? 80% were completely new. They were in the demographic that we were targeting. Um, We'd solved that problem for them. They loved the product so much. They brought their friends 
you know, it wasn't just one person queuing up at a time. They were bringing friends and queuing up for those that device. And, and probably also buying for family members as well. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. I think there's a lot of firsts. And I think when you're in it, you know you're doing something really innovative, but you don't know, you don't yet have the language to say exactly what it is. Yeah. And now in hindsight, you can see it. Mm. You know, it was backed up to the cloud. It had apps, it was connectivity, you know. It was it was designed to be entertaining, sharing, connecting. It's not just a voice device. It's not exactly. just a mobile. Exactly. And I think um, Hip Top's been a, a fantastic example that you've given us today about a product that's been exciting for you to launch. But have you got any, another really touches your heart example of delivering something to market? Um, another one I loved was one that we did together <laughs> um, at Virgin Mobile. I and wonder what that one was. <laughs> the thing was, uh, what I loved about Virgin was culturally it was super collaborative it was very much people planet profit so it was about are we are we doing the right thing are we aligning with so there were so many things that I could have built and launched but I when you set that test of does it align with the product the brand the strategy that's that's a validation that you should always have not just will it make us money think about does it align with the brand does it align with the strategy the company-wide strategy um and not, you know, not just build anything. So at Virgin Mobile, we had this problem where users were, we were experiencing churn, customers were leaving, and they were going to the competitors who offered data pooling. And it was at a time when, you know, Netflix had launched and this need for data and watching your Game of Thrones the moment it dropped on your commute on a Tuesday morning was really important. And so users were wanting to experience their mobile in that way uh, on their commute, stream data, and at, as a result, they were getting bill shock. They were going over their allowance. They were getting um, excess data charges, and we, which was super painful for anyone. And it was um, very expensive back then as well. Yeah, it was insanely expensive. Data was exploding. Um, and so what we looked at doing, and we worked together on this, Susan, was well, how do we solve this problem in a, only at Virgin Way. Don't copy your competitor, number one rule of product management. I stand by it. Uh, we didn't want to do data pooling because we knew, you know, logically customers, when they, customers are not silly. They're very smart. Respect your customer. They know if they buy mama phone, dad a phone, two kids a phone, and they're sharing data, they'll optimize the price. So mum will pay, pay more and have the large data allowance dad less, kids less, overall average revenue per user goes down. It gets dragged down. So you acquire more users, tick, that's great, but they're not profitable. Mm -hmm. And at the end of the day, your business, you want to be profitable, but you want to do it in a way that your customers love what you're doing. You're solving their problem. And so we, you know, we brainstormed, we collaborated. I had teams in a room from engineering, customer success, customer support, legal compliance, everything to ideate how do we solve this, which is really important because you want everyone on board on your solution. And what better way to get users on board, sorry, partners on board, you do this with users as well, is by build, designing the experience with them, solution with them. And so we designed data gifting. And data gifting meant anyone could gift and receive data uh, from anyone else on a Virgin mobile service. So immediately overnight, that would mean 1 million plus users, I can't remember how many it was, could yeah. share data with each other, which means that, well, first of all, they don't come into Virgin with um, the price, you know, optimising their price point, trying to game it, trying to get as much as they can. They come in going, okay, this is the plan I want because this is how much data I'm going to use. So it's that very, uh, if I'm by myself, this is what I'm using. And then when they have this need for extra data, Game of Thrones has dropped, something else has dropped, they want to watch something, maybe they want to stream something, they can ask their friends. They can gift and receive each other data. So overall, it became, it's a very, it was a very social product. We created it within the mobile app, one click. I know that the design team that worked on it were amazing. 
um, and the development team on how do we solve this problem and how do we do it in a way that we stay very virgin and branded, like the language we use, how it's fun, um, but also solve it in a way that complies with legal and regulatory. We're not spamming people. We're not, you know, so that's really super important. And the solution was like three clicks, right, Susan? It was so easy. Yeah, so like you sign into your app, you go to the page, and then you selected um, whoever you wanted to send it to and hit go. And the fact that we had it so integrated into your contacts, you don't have to type in or remember your friend's number. We figured all of that out for you. We made it so easy. So the user experience, I think, brought it together. And it was quite fun because it was quite a, it was a slider um, in the app. You kind of had, you know, something fun and whimsical when you got the, when you, when you sent the data, when you received data, it was really cool. So, um, but what we were doing is we made data currency as well, right? Data was now currency. You could give data and receive data. Um, you know, you can ask your, your friend uh, for data so you can watch Game of Thrones and in return you buy them a box of beers or whatever, right? You don't know. Um, but it's value exchange. And, again, going back to it was all about solving the problem, you working uh, with all the tools that you had with the stakeholders to get them excited to then to deliver something that the customers thought was absolutely amazing and became viral. The other thing that we did, which I thought was really, like I do this everywhere now, um, do a pre-launch with the, with the sales and support staff or with, you know, the employees because if they're using it and they're starting to enjoy it and they love it and they're gifting their mates as well, then they become more empowered, well, I guess more attached to it and more excited about it. And so you harness the power of your employees to talk about your product. And I think from memory, we even, with that internal launch, we even gifted everyone data internally as well. Yeah. Just to get them even more excited so they could watch that Game of Thrones. Yeah. And what it did, though, what I saw in the data, in the PNL, was that we were retaining users after that. Our churn rate was far less. We were retaining users. But what we also were doing was we were, we were acquiring at a faster rate. So more users were coming on board. The average revenue per user stayed, you know, held. We didn't lose average revenue per user, so that's crucial. But customers loved us that they stayed and they joined and they brought their friends. So it became, you know, barbecue, you know, I don't know, weekend conversations, barbecue conversations with friends. And so people were, it became this in-crowd thing, only at Virgin. Exactly. This. And so it was really exciting. You know, I mean, when Virgin ended, I could see that I think Belong took up that product. It kind of... Um, the, the, uh, there's a whole pile of now done iterations, yes. Exactly, right? But, you know, so there's always that idea of what, you know, there's that piece of um, there's the risk when you launch something for the first time that no one else has done it before, what's going to happen in product management, right? And that's always the fear that holds uh, that holds this these innovations back. Mm. Now, you know, I've done it with hip we've done it with data gifting, and you see that this continues, like those products themselves don't exist anymore, but you see, you know, hip top in the iPhone, right? You see that continue. You see data gifting in other, in other um, telco products. So I think that's really exciting. You want to, you want to create something that impacts the, the world positively like that. Exactly. And they've they've been two absolutely fantastic examples. Um, more most recently, what have you worked on that's exciting? Oh, I consulted to this company, which was so fascinating, a drone data platform. Um, and they had, again, they were a scale-up global based out of US and EU, Europe. Um and they had scaled really quickly and had a lot of users on their, on their platform, on their product. I think the exciting thing was that it was early days. Every market had different rules on how you fly, um, the pilot license, the rules of where you can fly, when you can fly, how high you can fly. 
the details of the drone that you use. Um, it's very exciting because it's like, you know, chat GPT, those early stages, you know that this is going to be um, change the world, but it's still about how do we harness this? How do we uh, design this for the better? So drone delivery, I think I was working on it during COVID. Um, they were working on, you know, this platform allowed users or anyone who was a hobbyist and loved flying drones to work out when they're going to drive fly and plan their flight on the Saturday morning or whenever, um, where they were going to fly, uh, have their licensing details on there, integrate with the regular regulator of the area, you know, CASA or FAA or, or wherever. Um, but on the other end, it also captured data on where people were flying, when they were flying, what they were flying. So the traffic of flight. So in, in, in a future of, you know, drone delivery, you can make sure that there is no collisions. In a future of um, delivering crucial, uh, you know, medical equipment or vaccines or whatever to different areas of the world, you can get, you can make sure that you've got the right drone, the right uh, flight details, flight path, that the safest way to, to get from A to B. I'd even assume weather as well, getting all that data as well to plug it in on which drone actually flies best during rain if it is an emergency to get it somewhere. Absolutely. So there's weather conditions, there's the regulatory and rules conditions, there's the details of the drone, there's the traffic, there's so many variables. So mapping that all is really exciting because I think there's lots of opportunity on, on future products. And I think I was really excited about it because it was during COVID and you'd hear of... Um, other companies like Wing delivering, doing uh, drone delivery trials around Australia. You know, Amazon imagine, trying to jump in on Amazon. it too. Amazon, I think, started that too. Um, Wing, Amazon, there's a few. And I think that's really exciting because that's another delivery mechanism. There's, you know, you've got your trucks, you've got your, your um, Uber drivers or trucks, uh, um, freight, fleet planes you know this is just another delivery mechanism and the question is what's most efficient at some point the cost of all of this will get to a point where you can choose which one's the most efficient way to deliver things and where you know during COVID online sales skyrocketed because everyone's was locked in and shopping from home so that behavior um, became really important for us to start you know for pro a lot of product people to look at that fleet management so yeah so that was really exciting there's that navigation aspect of gathering all that data for that platform. How do you get all the APIs working to plug that all in? The rules, the weather, the flight paths, the flight traffic, um, the drone data information, the use cases. Uh, I think there's just so many interesting using par parts that, you know, you know, that sort of thing is really exciting for me because I don't really turn off tapping into all of that. I think it's really interesting now with chat GPT where that can go as well. It's still very early days, but I'm pretty excited by it. I think a lot of people are worried about their jobs as well. How much will it take over? But <sighs> I, I, I think every new innovation, you always worry. There's always the, is it going to, am I still going to have a job to pay my mortgage? Like there's always that fear, like, I think um, I don't think that there is change doesn't necessarily mean job loss. It means change, change your skill set so you can be part of these jobs of the future. Learn how to use these AIs and chat GPT to make your life easier because you're not always going to get the, so right now I've been playing with chat GPT. It doesn't always give me the right answer. So it depends on how you ask it, the prompts that you use. Um, oftentimes I've had to correct it too and, and it just keeps learn, learning and that's a, a another perfect segue into um, my next question which I love to ask which is mistakes happen issues happen pros and cons let's talk a bit about the the cons so what mistakes do you think product and marketing managers are doing today when it comes to product management So mistakes, there's mistakes in not solving the right problem, solving, you know, doing the easy win of 
copying what the competitor has, um, not going deep on what is the most painful problem that the user has and how is it being solved today and how can I make this better? So that, that discovery piece, because you can be in the right area but not actually solve the most painful problem. And so then it becomes irrelevant for the user or not strong enough or not compelling enough for them to move from what they're doing today to your product. So that's really important. I think also in smaller companies, go to market sometimes gets forgotten because um, you can get obsessed with building something. So go to market's really crucial. And and going on to your, your point before, I think that they're, um, just because your competitor is doing it doesn't mean their customers are happy. So by copying them, you, you actually may not actually know the impact of customer, particularly if it's an add-on service. Is it actually needed or is it more of a piss-off factor to the customer? That's one of the, the gaps if you don't do, um, like for research would be a big one for me with product management. If you don't do enough research to understand customer needs, usage, the problem itself, you're just delaying um, the inevitable that these people will leave you, unfortunately, because you're not helping them. And not just that, you may have wasted a ton of resources on a feature that no one uses. It's like wasted effort that you could have used solving a real problem that people care enough about to pay for, to switch to you for. So, you know, there's a lot of, I think, a lot of things that get launched that felt like a good idea at the time. And then, you know, it never reaches the business case forecast of how many users will use it, how much they'll pay for it. And Vegemite's probably a great example of not understanding users and doing the, I think it was called 2.0 at the time, and that was the name of the product, and people were just like, what? Vegemite, really? Mm. I love Vegemite, and I just discovered that I can get it gluten-free. That so. is a very big plus for you. <laughs> very excited <laughs> um, but when you're thinking about smaller companies I think you, you have a great point about resources what resource do you think that there's some common mistakes happening to mm. resources in terms of like I'm thinking that I'm going back to our earlier discussion the numbers mm. so um, not understanding the numbers itself mm. So needing to de-risk the viability. So I think in small companies, there's so much to do, but there's not much resources and it's which one is the most important thing. So prioritization is so important at that point. And knowing that, you know, you want to prioritize, well, what are your goals seeking? Are you seeking for acquisition of new customers as quickly as possible? Then you'll go for growth. Then you'll get a, you know, a product marketer or a growth marketer on board. Um, to grow it as quickly as possible. But if you're thinking about how do I do this profitably? How do I make sure that there is a profit per product? I'm not blitz scaling. I'm not looking at like doing this at a loss, which I don't think many can afford right now. It's really important to go close to your customer. What is the most painful problem? Solve that. And sometimes, you know, there's, you know, early on in my career, it was like build it and they will come. And so you, you, there was this whole, you build the product and then you go, okay, who's going to use this? Who's the customer? <laughs> and particularly amazing. when it's completely new as well. Yeah. And you're first to market. Yeah. So I, I think, think in the early stages, a lot of it goes down to the founders and the founders team rolling up their sleeves and actually doing the work, not just delegating. And so there's a, it's a bit of a shift from a corporate where you, mm. you build those relationships and partnerships and stakeholders and um, bring people on the journey and, and do all of that. You actually have to do it yourself. Mm. So being and really, um, I guess, uh, uh, inventive or resourceful is really important. Exactly. And the whole, the whole Blue Ocean piece as well, uh, I, I suppose one of the biggest gaps would be um, how to frame the product when there isn't an existing um, oh, market or anything. Well, here's the thing. If you're creating something completely new, there's a lot of fear and change and where does this fit in and how will the salesperson explain this and how will I explain this on the website if it's, you know, uh, direct to consumer and they're buying it themselves, self-service. And this framing is really powerful. So knowing what the most painful problem is that the user has, frame it from that problem as opposed to frame from an existing 
you know, industry or market, set your frame, set your context and talk about the product from that sense. Um, one of the books that I was reading, April Dunford, so I do have books around here, uh, talks about, you know, this, <clears throat> how would you frame, you know, cake pop? When cake pops first came out, so is it a lollipop? Is it a cake? It's a, it's a category that doesn't exist right now. How would you frame that, you know? Um, so you have to kind of think about it from the end user, the problem that the user has and frame it from that angle. And it's really exciting because you can design what your context is. You create the market. You want to be in a position where you're creating the market because then it's not compared to what exists today, the incumbent. And you want to kind of, you know, sever that thinking in a customer's mind when they think about who your competitor is so they don't think of that. Um, there's a really great story that April talks about where they did this experiment in Washington outside of a train station uh, where they had a like globally acclaimed uh, violinist play. Sweatshirt, sweatshirt um, cap, just like a busker. So he didn't, you know, you didn't know his pedigree, his background, how long he'd been playing, that he'd been playing since he was four years old or any of that. And so you did it during rush hour where people are just like, the context is I need to get to work. I'm running late. I'm just like, I don't have time to stop and listen or enjoy. And so, you know, his value was much less in that context. His, his value as a product was not was not valued in that audience for that audience in that context context in that setting but put him in a um you know at the opera or, or playing in a in a venue sell sell tickets have a brochure that talks about his background and how he'd been playing since he was four years old and all the accolades that he's had um and that audience appreciates that product the talent the you know, and so they value it at a higher rate. So that context is so powerful. 100% agree. And, and again, it comes down to um, P's of marketing. Um, place is hugely important. Absolutely. So, so coupling that with the context, you really have to think through what your product management process is going to be. And also, as you said, go to market as well. Um, but when, when you're doing all this, I'm, I'm sure there's a lot of tools that you use or can recommend. What would be the top, say, five that you use and why? Oh, the tools that I use. Uh, I'm a big fan of Miro. I can't go back ever since I've started using Miro, like the the boards, the templates, the formats. I Miro over Figma? Yes, because I think Figma is great if you're because I'm a product person. I'm not into the design as much. I can create, you know, we talk about wireframing and and mapping how the experience should look. But in terms of design, I think it's important to respect your designer to do that and let them do their their job. Same with engineering. You know, we talk about no code tools and that, and you can only go so far. You do need an expert, and so respecting their experience and what they bring is really important. But, yeah, so I, I do like Miro. I have played with Figma. I do get a little bit lost with Figma, and it slows me down. But Miro doesn't slow me down, so I really like Miro. Um, that's with that. The other thing I do like is mapping the customer journey and what they're doing in real time um, through, like, a mix panel or an amplitude so you can see what they're doing. I think that's really powerful. So I do like using those. Uh, other than that, I like I use um, you know, the Google Docs sheets for collaboration slides. Uh, I do like using Canva as well. For someone who's not a designer, I think it's it it helps. It's like it's got some really good templates in there, and they keep evolving. Um, talking about a great product and also the product management behind that. I think that they've been very clever in what they've built from the minimum viable through to what it has now. I think it's so powerful and it's integrated with AI as well. So it's even easier to use. Um, I do like um, Notion as well as a storage. I Since I've read about, you know, second brain, I kind of use a lot of, I, I write on my notes, uh, either Google Docs or Notion, so then I can cross-reference and check back. And I think that that whole second brain is really interesting. 
helpful, can do so much more, helps you be, you know, run faster. Other than that, my Slack, email, they're mm -hmm. kind of the simple tools. Yep. yep. And um, I know you've talked about this already, so your answer might already have been completed. But what excites you most about product management if you could bring it down to just two short sentences, if you can? What, what would you say? Solving painful problems, finding the most painful problems, solving those painful problems so that we alleviate human pain through developing products, services, solutions that make the world a better place. And so by doing that, the users that use them love it so much they bring others love it and lucky last question i ask every single person what brand best represents you and why um so i didn't talk about this much but probably my skincare brand that i created kadi botanicals because my tagline that i'd used was beauty without harm and that is very much about creating a product that solves a painful problem. So I had, you know, allergies and uh, sensitive skin and reactions. And so I really needed something that was toxin free. So I needed something that will not harm my health and anyone's health. So no harm to your health, no harm to animals. So I never used animal testing or any, and, and it's all vegan, which is really important because there's a lot of powerful you know, ingredients in nature, in in um, botanicals, Australian botanicals, kakadu plum, lily, and so they're really quite, there's a lot of um, ingredients and vitamins and antioxidants that are really natural and, you know, it's there. So no harm to your health, no harm to animals, no harm to the planet because I agonised over packaging, um, making sure that there was no plastic because even recycled plastic is still plastic. So I used glass, you know, I went down this rabbit hole of looking at plastic made out of plants and, you know, the economics of it. And so I, so the brand is about beauty without harm or so no harm to your health, the planet, animals. And so I think that's that's how I like to do product management. So something that solves a problem but doesn't break something else, doesn't contribute to a problem elsewhere because then you're just kicking it down the down the road and I think of it now it's the language about circular economy from that space I love it I mm -hmm. do love it and there will be a future podcast specifically on Kadir Patakens so we'll look everyone will look forward to listening <laughs> to that one but um, Irene thank you so much for your time today going through product manager and product management the difference helping us understand customer perception from a high low point of view and also the competitors is really an important lens aligning everyone internally and also externally like partners for the goal of product management that you're trying to bring because you're trying to solve a real problem it's also really key and I heard it quite a lot through this discussion about how validation and doing test tests and iterations is extremely important to make sure you're delivering what you believe in your heart is helping the world and the customer. And the final one is making sure there's always value to the business and the end users, no matter what those metrics may be from money through to the experience itself. So again, thank you so much, Irene. Uh, don't forget to add more to marketing to your playlist so you don't miss out on fabulous guests like Irene today. Thank you again, thank Irene. You. And if you want to find me, I'm just on LinkedIn. You can connect with me there. I post quite a bit. Um, I do teaching and I, yeah, anything product management, I also mentor users. Fantastic. I will have the link in the comment section and also include in the blog. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. More to marketing. <laughs>